Uh, dear all, welcome to this NephroTube uh, online webinar. At the first, I want uh, to make a notice that all NephroTube uh, lectures in the form of uh, PowerPoint are available at our website, uh, nephrotube.com. And all uh, the webinars and lectures are recorded uh, as a video uh, in both English and Arabic languages, and you'll find the recording of these uh, webinars on NephroTube uh, YouTube channel. You can subscribe to this channel, and also you can follow the activities of our uh, nice group regarding uh, case scenarios, uh, sharing of different recent articles on the Facebook group, Facebook page, and Twitter. And now it's my pleasure to moderate this uh, webinar about idiopathic membranous glomerular nephritis in a nutshell. And our presenter today is uh, Dr. Sally Katib. Actually, Dr. Sally has a long CV, uh, and the time is not enough to mention all what, uh, all what uh, are in her CV. She is now uh, a nephrology specialist uh, registrar in Leicester Hospital in UK. And she will uh, describe to us now her experience regarding different cases of membranous nephropathy. Uh, please, Dr. Sally, uh, share your screen now, and the mic is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hello. Good afternoon. Sally, can you uh, uh, activate the slide from the down right bottom? Yes. Is it has it worked? Click on it. Is that is that yes. any better? It, yes, it is. It is better now. You can start. OK, great. Welcome uh, everyone to um, our um, presentation. Um, my name is Sally, I'm a specialist at Lister Hospital and it's a real privilege to be here with all of you. And thank you very much, Dr. Abdel Gawed for this very overwhelming introduction. Um, I'd like to just start by uh, saying that today, my agenda basically will be a recap for the idiopathic membranous GN introduction. And then we're gonna talk about the antiplots who are antibodies. Then we're updating the management according to the Kidigo guidelines in October, 2021, which have really um, changed for this um, type of GN. Then we will define the outcomes, focus a bit on the rituximab, and then I'm very happy to put a timeline for all the trials that I believe have contributed to our um, management in IMGN. Um, I also would like to share our experience at the Lister Hospital by um, discussing our audit, specifically with using rituximab in uh, this cohort. So, just briefly, we do know that the global incidence of membranous GN is about one in 100,000, which um, approximately 80% are primary um, MGN or idiopathic membranous glomerulonephropathy. Male to female is two to one, so males are more affected than females and the peak age is between 50 to 60, but obviously it can occur at any age. Patients could present all the way from a subnephrotic range of proteinuria to a nephrotic range. Renal function is typically um, normal at presentation, though this is not the rule. And as we know, um, the disease progression is very gradual in pace because uh, this disease is very unique in um, the context of gradual accumulation of subepithelial deposits, and that obviously takes time to result in the podocyte uh, damage, which are the cells hugging the uh, glomeruli. 
end stage develops up to a third of our uh, patients, sadly. And now, uh, just for some reminders, I know that most of uh, doctors on the call are quite senior, but I just like starting from basics. Um, this is a beautiful photo here, um, the histopathology finding the thick um, glomerular basement membrane, which is very typical for membranous GN. And then here's another beautiful photo with the silver stain showing all the spikes. Um, and then finally, the subepithelial deposits of primary membranous GN. I just like to remind everyone that if it's a secondary membranous GN, then you, know, you do not necessarily have the subepithelial deposits. You're gonna get subendothelial deposits, you're gonna get endothelial TRIs, mesangial proliferation, and sort of like the full house blown picture of immunoglobulins, because as we know, secondary idiopathic membranous GN is associated with all autoimmune disease, such as SLE. Um, but my focus today is on the idiopathic type. Now, we've gone a long way with the pathogenesis of um, this type of GN, which makes it my favorite. Um, it all started in 1946, and we started to understand more uh, in 2009, so it's really been a very long, bumpy road. Now, as we all know, that in 2009, that's when the discovery of the M-type phospholipase A2 receptor as an antigen in the podocyte, and it was thought that the expression on the podocytes makes it an antigen and a target for the antiplar 2 r antibodies to form and start attacking the uh, basement membrane. Now, we don't really know why it happens in certain patients and why it doesn't to others. So I think there's a lot to work on. So antiplar 2 r antibodies, um, as we know, it's an autoimmune disease and the antibodies have been identified in 70% of patients. There's been a meta-analysis of nine studies showing 710 patients, and the PLA2R sensitivity is 0.78%, so very, very sensitive, and the specificity is even more. We know that the level and the titer of PLA2R antibody is related to disease remission, so we know that when we start treating patients, when the level of PLA2R antibody drops, then we know that we are heading towards remission. So it's a very good monitor for um, treatment. So definitely a decline in the teachers does predict the clinical response to immunosuppression. Now, I'd like to highlight here that staining the kidney biopsy for anti 2 r by immunofluorescence provides another dimension. So it's not just that you get um, the detection of the antibodies hanging around in your circulation, but you can actually stain the kidney itself for these um, receptors. Now, according to the new kidney guidelines, which I'm going to dwell uh, in detail very soon, but I just want to, um, in relation to that bit, that a kidney biopsy is not really required to confirm the diagnosis of membranous um, GN, um, specifically when you do know that you've got a PLA2R antibody, which is positive, and you already got an nephrotic syndrome. So, however, if your EGFR is less than 60, then we would all agree that it's always useful to have a biopsy, even if you know the diagnosis, because there's always um, a sort of balance. How much are you going to give? How much immunosuppression are you going to give the patients? Um, so we could guide our treatment, because if your kidney is already scarred, then it doesn't really make any sense to just hammer people with immunosuppression and put them through um, horrific side effects. Um, and again, we just monitor the levels of PLA2R at six months after the start of therapy, and then we could make those adjustments to the treatment. Um, a reminder that the most sensitive technique to um, detect PLA2R is actually the Western blot, though it is not it's the most sensitive, but it's not commercially available in the UK. And we do use mostly the ELISA assay, 
and the lowest cutoff is uh, 14. So like anything between two and 14 is like sort of equivocal. Um, so the positive results are usually uh, above 14. In a fewer hospitals, we use the immunofluorescence technique and it appears in teeters, like one over 100, one over 320 um, and so on. Again, um, if we measure the PLA2R antibodies and then we start measure, measuring them every three to six months, the disappearance of the PLA2R antibodies do indicate likely remission. And then you should stop at that point and give no additional therapy. And then if it is persistent, after three to six months of therapy, it just reflects that you have persistence disease activity and you should start reconsidering more therapy. Um, that is just to show us how valuable this uh, milestone in this idiopathic membranous GN has provided us. I'd like to stop here for a bit because we all think that primary membranous GN, you must have anti or antibody positive. But actually, 30% of patients have other detectable types of antibodies, and yet there are undiscovered antigens even in the primary gene. Shall I carry on, Dr. Uh, Abdegawet? Yes, 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 go on. Okay. Um, so a positive test for anti R is highly suggestive of primary, but if you don't have PLA2R positive antibodies, you might be having another antibody, but we just don't have the assay to test for it, or even it's falling under the undiscovered antibodies. The other thing also that is so worth mentioning, if you have a patient who's got an antibody that is positive, you are almost sure that they've got idiopathic membranous GN. That does not mean that they don't have coexistent malignancy. Actually, the NEL1 has been associated with malignancy. So this comes to the recommendations in the Kidigo 2021, which makes so much sense that patients with membranous GN should be evaluated for associated conditions, regardless whether they've got antibodies absent or present. I'm not gonna uh, waste so much of our time here, but this is a lovely photo. It just skims through the patient from head to toes. What do you really need to do? So the chest X-ray to exclude sarcoid. So you're basically going through all the secondary causes of membranous GN, the virology, the malignancies, and obviously taking a full history. Now, I'd like to stop here again. I wanna set our targets and make sure we're all on the same page. What is a complete remission for all types? It is the proteinuria less than 0.3 grams a day. So a third gram, which is a urinary PCR less than 30. And then we've got the partial remission, which means a 50% reduction in proteinuria or basically just less than three and a half grams a day. And then people who relapse obviously go back to having more than three and a half grams a day. So you've got the complete remission, the partial remission, and then obviously the non-remission, the NR group, who do not actually respond to any sort of treatment. Um, I'll go back to that slide. So I just want to say the value of partial remission. Um, we'll talk about this study briefly. This is a study done in, the, in Toronto, the CATRAN study. It kind of shows us how valuable remission is, whether it's partial or complete. So there are 348 nephrotic patients. Uh, so they are nephrotic with various types of glomerulonephritis and they were followed up for 12 months from the Toronto GN registry. Patients then went into three groups, 102 experienced a complete remission, 136 a bit more had partial remission and 110 had no remission. Now, going back to this slide, Simply, you could see um, my pointer. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not a very um, technology person, but I don't think I'll be man I'll, I'll be able to use the pointer. But if you can see that, if you have complete remission, a hundred percent, you are not going. According to this study, of course, that no one went into end stage. No one required renal replacement therapy. If we compare that to people who went into 
partial remission and then no remission, the ones who went into no remission had a 50% chance to end up needing renal replacement therapy. So no doubt that a partial or a complete remission is a very important therapeutic target with lots of implications for renal survival and progression rate. Now, just a reminder, immunosuppression, what do we use for this um, type of glomerulonephritis? I guess more or less like most other types of GN. So we've got the CNI inhibitors with or without low dose steroids, but please remember, never give steroids alone. They just don't work. The modified Ponticelli and then the rituximab. Um, I'll pause here again to remind everyone on the call that there is a very, very fine balance from treating someone or just tipping them over with side effects and no benefit. So we have to think twice or even more before starting any sort of immunosuppression. We'll go to basics again. I know this is quite junior, but I think we all have to be reminded. So the modified Ponticelli in 1998, it's the cyclophosphamide slash chlorambucil um, alternating so you with steroids. So basically, it's a six-month treatment. One month is steroids. You pulse people for the first three days, and then you carry on the rest of the month giving oral prednisolone. And then we've got the um, month number two, you give the cyclophosphamide. In UK, we, um, or at least in my hospital, we um, go for the oral more than the um, IV form. Um, please remember that there are those adjustments for cyclophosphamide whenever the GFR falls below 50. Um, I'm gonna try and simplify this. So according to the KIDIGO, we um, classify patients according to low risk, moderate, high, and very high. This is very wordy. And I just want to say that the low risk people have a normal eGFR and a proteinuria of less than three and a half grams a day, which just means a uh, non-nephrotic range. The moderate, they still have a normal eGFR, but the proteinuria is, any, is, is, is more, is more than three and a half. It's kind of like between four and eight. High risk, we start losing eGFR, and then the proteinuria is more than eight grams a day. And the very high risk go through very life-threatening nephrotic syndrome. And we all know about life-threatening nephrotic syndrome. So low, moderate, high risk, very high risk. Just to recap, it's all about kidney function and the level or the amount of proteinuria as the proteinuria and renal function progress. You move up the ladder from low risk to very high risk. So the recommendations um, are, if you're low risk, then you wait and see, which is very sensible. So you're gonna treat patients with no immunosuppression. You will give them ACE, ARBs, get their fluid balance right, um, address their blood pressure, and do all our normal conservative management. If you have a moderate risk, if you sort of fall under this category, um, as it says, wait and see, but I know very few nephrologists uh, that would actually wait and see. I think you'll be very keen to do something because that's what we like doing as doctors. So I think most people will think, um, shall we do a bit of CNI inhibitors, um, plus or minus a bit of steroids? Um, as we know, the CNI inhibitors are very good at um, sort of protecting the cytoskeletal structure of the podocyte. So apart from having the action on um, the T cells, as in hammering your immune system, they also um, provide good um, sort of um, protection because they make the podocytes stronger and make your proteinuria less. Or are you gonna give rituximab? Remember high risk and very high risk, you're gonna start thinking of cyclophosphamide. So you could say cyclophosphamide or rituximab plus or minus steroids. Um, others will just um, treat with um, a bit of CNI inhibitors plus rituximab. Very high risk, you have one option 
which is cyclophosphamide glucocorticoids, glucocorticoids. There is no time for soft treatment. Um, I just want to remind everyone again that CNI monotherapy we know is less efficient. Uh, CNI for six to 12 months with rapid withdrawal is associated with a very high degree of relapse. We've all used CNI inhibitors and we know that people relapse once you stop them. So seeing patients day in and day out, you really need to keep this CNI at least um, six months, um, especially in the high risk. So in the high risk patients, the addition of rituximab after six months is advised, um, but you need to be very cautious when you start stopping the CNI inhibitors. Um, there is something I would like to delay, but let's, we'll come back to it. But it's very good as well to use the CNI inhibitors initially and then introduce rituximab because as we know, when you lose protein in your urine, you are losing immunoglobulins. And as we know that rituximab sticks to these um, uh, proteins. And if you lose it, lose it in the urine, then you are getting a less effective dose of rituximab. So it's always nice to control the proteinuria, make the amount of uh, protein leak less, and then give the rituximab so that you're not losing rituximab in the urine. And I'm happy to sort of talk about this more if needed. The landmarks, uh, the trials, um, again, uh, we move back from the 1946 to 1959 when um, Heyman nephritis was described. That was a very exciting stage of the disease. So basically the scientists injected rats with tubular, um, tubular cells from a human kidney and the tubular cells obviously contain antigen. So expectedly the rat started to form antibodies. And then this created a situation where membranous GN was actually discovered. And then there's the Ponto Chile in 1984. Um, and then following that in 1998, that was when we got the information, how useful it is to uh, treat people with steroids. Um, with um, cyclophosphamide or chlorambucil, but it's usually cyclophosphamide now because we know chlorambucil has very bad side effects. Um, this is a, a study in the Lancet, Prof. Mathieson. Um, I'll talk about each one in, 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 in just like briefly, uh, but this is a study the um, British people are very proud about because this uh, is uh, pro probably an English study. So that was 2013. And then 2009, as we know, was the era of anti plar antibodies. Then we've got the Gemritrox, a French study, and then this amazing mentor study in 2019, followed by the Starman in 2020, and then the Rituxyclo in 2021. Now, I do not like to be uh, giving too much information. So if you would like to read more about the studies, uh, you're more than welcome to. The slides are informative and the references are there but I will just like sort of summarize. So I'll start with the 2013 um, study by Prof. Mathieson's group, and that was published in the Lancet. So there was a biopsy proven idiopathic membranous GN, 108 patients with a two year follow-up, and they were sort of comparing supportive treatment to CNI to Pontocelli. And in this study, the Pontocelli wins. I'm just going to say this. So basically, end stage renal failure was least in the Pontocelli group, which shows that the Pontocelli slows the rate of decline in renal function as compared to the supportive uh, care and the CNI inhibitors. But let's see what happens. So after 2013, we got the Gemritox study. Now, this is a multicenter. French study, like 31 centers contributed to this study. Um, not very huge number of patients, uh, 80 patients, and they were sort of split into two arms. We've got 37 had six month therapy of non-immunosuppression. We, uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, dwell into this, but non-immunosuppression, I mean the ACE, the ARBs, et cetera. Um, and then the same arm, so basically they had the non-immunosuppression plus two doses of rituximab, one in day one, 
and one in day eight. And then the other arm were 38 patients who were just treated with uh, non-immunosuppression therapy. And the primary outcome was detecting either CR, which is the um, complete remission or partial remission at six months. Now, if you look at this, uh, knowing how rituximab works, do we think that this study was very useful? So unfortunately, this is described as a flawed study, a low quality study, according to Kidigo. And this is no surprise because six months is no really huge difference between rituximab and uh, the non-immunosuppression arm on its own, because it takes a lot of time until the rituximab starts to work. So this really explains why that at six months, there was no huge difference between the two arms. But then um, when they did like another year of follow-up, there was actually a difference between the group that received rituximab with the conservative management as compared to the ones who only had conservative management. So the take on message from this Gemretrox study is that rituximab takes time. And this has been consolidated with the mentor study. So the mentor study is a very powerful study, I would say, very good statistics. And um, they included the 22 sites from um, North America, all proven membranous nephropathy on biopsy. Proteinuria was, was huge actually. So they all had a decent amount of proteinuria of 500 grams. Um, and then all of them had a creatinine clearance of more than 40 mils per minute. Let's just try and retain that the renal function here was actually not too bad. So the treatment was started, I would say early because we sometimes give people immunosuppression, um, I think too late when your kidney function is pretty uh, bad and your kidneys are scarred. So as we see here, um, one arm received just rituximab and the other arm received cyclosporin. So very simple, at 12 months, just 12 months, you can see, mm, yeah, there is a difference favoring the rituximab, 60% as compared to 52 with the cyclosporin, but not so much. Then you wait longer for another 12 months, so another year, 24 months in total, you get a very, very significant superior result, which is 60% for rituximab as compared to 20% only for cyclosporin. So, Again, it's a repetition of what I said, but that's just to help us memorize things. So at 12 months, rituximab was non-inferior to the cyclosporin, but at 24 months, the rituximab was superior. So this is a noticeable um, advantage of rituximab. Now, coming to the um, Spanish study, uh, the Starman study. Now, the Starman study, 19 centers in Spain, 86 patients enrolled, and this was basically just comparing the modified Pontocelli um, to the tacrolimus. Um, apologies, it is the cyclical sort of Pontocelli alternating with uh, CNI, and then the second arm was just purely tacrolimus plus rituximab. And the outcome of Starman, the primary outcome was uh, figuring out the complete or partial remission at 24 months. And as we see that treatment with modified Pontocelli induced remission for most of the patient and the results were very much favoring the Pontocelli. So Pontocelli wins here. Complete remission at 24 months was 60% in the arm of patients who received Ponticelli, as in compared with the ones only 26% uh, TAC and rituximab. Now, I think we should take all these studies with a pinch of salt um, and just get the moral of the study. Um, I, I don't think that it necessarily means that we have to you know, treat people with Ponticelli. That's why we look into the studies and then we come up with the guidelines. 
And then we've got the Rituk cyclo, uh, very briefly, again, 74 patients, one arm received rituximab, the other arm received modified Pontocelli, and then we looked again into the outcomes. Again, at 12 months, rituximab, 16% achieved complete remission as compared to 32% uh, for those who had the Pontocelli. Again, if we skip most of the slide, but come to the at 24 months, 85% receiving rituximab have actually achieved complete or partial remission as in compared to the 81 of cyclical regimen. So this actually means that in this study, it is actually indicating that rituximab could be as powerful as cyclophosphamide. So rituximab here in this study was as powerful as the cyclophosphamide, or sorry, the uh, Pontocelli. And the adverse side effects were um, not so different. So although one year probability was lower in the rotoximab, again, waiting 24 months follow up, there was no significance between the two arms. And this was actually a very good study. Um, we'll take questions at the end, but I am coming to the second half of, um, am I okay with time, Dr. Abdegawed? Yes, it's okay. You can go on. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I am going to share our experience at the Lister Hospital here in Stevenage. Um, we done so what we call an audit. So, as we all know, we compare our practice to the national and international guidelines, and then we try to apply a change and revisit what happens after the change. Have we actually managed to improve the care the patients take, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially we did an audit in 2017. And then I did another re-audit just, um, just last year, year past. The numbers in the first audit here were just 15 patients with a mean age of 59. And they all, um, at the time, uh, received rituximab infusion. The median time from the diagnosis to receiving rituximab was actually seven months. And 60% of patients had previously failed immunosuppression. So it's kind of like some patients have had previous treatments and rituximab was not the first line. And in other patients, rituximab was the first line of treatment. So um, in this group, uh, specifically six, had rituximab and it was the first line of treatment. Um, it could be to various uh, reasons, um, including that maybe they've got like chest problems, recurrent hospital admission, sepsis, bronchiectasis, uh, we're worried about steroid side effects, anything that would uh, dictate that rituximab should uh, be the first line of treatment. So the results were very similar to that, I would say the, the mentor study. So 60% achieved um, a complete remission or partial remission and 40% did not respond. And the EGFR has actually improved in all the patients who achieved either a complete or a partial remission. Um, and EGFR has stabilized in most patients. Um, coming to my, our re-audit, so I don't want to bore anyone on the call. Um, I'll try to summarize. So we reviewed 35 courses, but they were 33 patients. And the reason I say 35 courses um, is because two of these patients who went into complete remission after the first course were retreated with a course after the relapse. So this makes it 35 courses, but we have 33 patients, so there's no confusion. It's just that two went into relapse and then they were just retreated with another lot of rituximab. All patients received a gram, twice approximately two weeks apart. Um, renal biopsy showed um, in, in most of the patients, which is 32, uh, they all had a renal biopsy. Uh, we could not, uh, you know, for accuracy, I'm not sure what happened to the last uh, patient. Uh, he might have not had a renal biopsy for any reason. And 27 of the 33, two patients, uh, apologies, the 33 patients, you could actually see uh, the IgG4 deposits on the renal.
we were probably trying to treat, watch and see what will happen. Most of them were anticoagulated. And 20, I think in my hospital, we tried to anticoagulate people below an albumin of 20 is, you know, it would be very brave not to, um, unless they have a very high bleeding risk or anything around the lines. Um, so, Rituximab uh, was the first line of treatment in nine patients. And I just have the initials uh, here. So for example, we'll just like discuss two patients. So for example, Mr. SI was obese, had osteoporosis, had depression, recurrent sepsis. This is why we opted to choose Rituximab rather than anything else as a first line of treatment. Uh, HK, for example, had lots of AKI admissions schizophrenia, so it's really hard to give him steroids. So this is why rituximab was the first line in those nine patients. Looking at the urinary PCR, so I am just uh, going to talk about the whole cohort, and then we're going to look into the ones who achieved complete remission, and then the ones who achieved partial remission as opposing the non-responders. So the urinary PCR was quite high. Uh, the range was 337 to 330. So on a median, it was like 1017. So very, very nephrotic patients. Um, renal function was normal in just 11, if we look at the whole group, and was quite impaired in 24 courses. And the, the median was an EGFR of 32. So compared to the other studies, we actually started giving them rituximab at a lower level of uh, kidney function. Uh, and it's obviously known that the lower the kidney function is, you are likely not to respond well to the immunosuppression. So it's always better to catch people at a better level of kidney function. Now, the outcome simply was very similar to both the mentor and the Ritox cyclo trial, which both achieved a PR, partial remission, or CR, complete remission of 60%. So our results were very comparable to these uh, studies. Um, I'll try not to go into much detail, but I will now talk a bit more about the group who achieved complete remission. The stuff highlighted in red is the ones um, I would like us to remember, please. So 13 patients of the 35, no, 13 courses of the 35, achieved um, complete remission. So first we looked at complete or partial, that's 60%, and then the non-responders are 40%. Now, how, much, how many patients achieved CR, complete remission, is just 37%. Um, and the median time for complete remission is 10.5 months. So Complete remission actually took 10.5 months, which is again comparable with the studies we have actually spoke about, which was like something like 12 months. So it's very close. And then for the duration of the follow-up, 10 of the 11 patients until current date, which is amazing, they have all kept their status of complete remission. So most of the patients remain until today, as we speak, in complete remission. And it's worth mentioning that two of the patients, um, they did receive complete remission, but then they relapsed, and then they had another lot of uh, rituximab, and then they went on to enjoy a second period of complete remission. And the renal function in most of these courses that achieve complete remission have been very stable. Only I would say there was a significant drop of EGFR maybe in, in, in one patient. Now looking at the partial remission at its best, nine of the courses achieve partial remission and actually the median is less. So basically, you do enter partial remission much quicker than compared compared like to the complete remission. So it's like a median of 5.5 months only. And I wanted to talk in detail about these nine patients. So five of them remained in sustained partial remission and four got relapses. And as it say, says here, one patient, for example, 
relapsed, just as an example, and then went into a severe AKI and ended up on renal replacement therapy. Another patient um, had uh, Pontocelli. Um, and then now going on to um, looking at the renal function in patients who achieved partial remission, expectedly they did worse uh, compared to the patients who had complete remission. And in the non-responders, because I'm running out of time, I just wanna say that they all mostly did very badly and this is not a surprise. The pre-rituximab treatment, all the PCRs were within the nephrotic range. Post-rituximab treatment was more or less the same because simply the treatment did not work. But reflecting on what happened with the patients, whether we should have redosed the patient with rituximab or not, uh, remains questionable because we have not actually um, done that. And the outcome was that six patients ended up on renal replacement therapy, four patients went on to try Pontocelli, and interestingly, Pontocelli did work for some people who did not respond to their rituximab. And sadly, two patients uh, opted for just conservative management and they died. So this slide here just shows the EGFR outcome. And all I can take from this is again to consolidate the fact that if you go into complete remission, if we go on to EGFR that declined and compare complete to partial to none, only one patient in the group of CR declined his um, kidney function as compared to five in the partial remission. And then when we go to the non-responders, they've all all declined their EGFR. So there was a significant association between EGFR status and the outcome of the patient. Um, before I go on to the conclusion, um, I would just want to say I've attached lots of slides, but asking ourselves a question here in the audit, we looked into whether the EGFR at presentation determines and predicts the outcome or not. And actually there was a significance. So people who um, had a complete remission, they had the best EGFR at presentation, followed by the partial remission. And the last was the non-responders. I appreciate that the difference was not huge, but there was a definite um, slight difference between um, the EGFR at the start prior to rituximab treatment in the group, for example, who achieved complete remission as compared to the non-responders. Um, so this is something we, we should think about. Going back to the conclusions. So obviously we are working on getting the NHS England set up trial now uh, to fund rituximab for our patients. Um, and the report was due in June, 2022. Uh, so there's a lot of work uh, going on here to fund uh, patients for rituximab. And we've managed to get rituximab for most patients, even to redose them with rituximab. Um, and I appreciate this is not the case in all countries, uh, but there's always hope. Um, now, again, in summary, our response rate was very comparable to the mentor and the rituxic cyclo. So as we achieved complete or partial remission at 60%, this was similar to the mentor and the rituxic cyclo. And again, complete remission was achieved um, in 37% of patients in our audit. Um, our previous audit, it was 33%, and then the mentor was 35%. Again, looking at the timeline, the median time, how long does it take for the rituximab to make patients enter a complete remission? It was 10.5 months in our audit, very comparable to the mentor and the rituxiclo, which was about a little bit more, 11.5, but yeah. Um, and then we are also considering the redosing with rituximab if a patient uh, relapse. And 
this is uh, specifically due to the fact that if you don't, if you respond to rituximab the first time, you are likely to respond to rituximab the second time, and we've seen it in our patients. Again, partial remission, median time uh, was 5.5 months. Um, as expected, and I said it many times, renal function in both CR and PR groups reflect more stability as in compared to the non-responders. Um, we no doubt offer rituximab at a two advanced EGFR compared with the other trials. So in, in our audit, it was like an EGFR of 30 or even less than 30. Um, I think it was 30 to 36. Starman, they recruited patients with an EGFR of more than 45. Mentor was more than 40. And then the Gemritrox was 30, but we agreed that this was a flawed study anyway. Um, we had patients with an EGFR of less than 30 at the time of rituximab. One achieved complete remission, one achieved uh, partial remission, and the rest all were non-responders. Um, this brings me back to what Prof uh, Mathieson's opinion. He's actually uh, supporting the opinion that if your creatinine is actually more than 300, it's probably very too late for any immunosuppression. And you should not really consider any redosing with an EGFR of less than 20 mils per minute. I have explained the compensatory urinary loss of rituximab in um, the nephrotic patients. So as you are nephrotic, you are losing the rituximab. And whether we are rushing into labeling people as non-responders because we actually did not try and minimize the amount of proteinuria by CNIs initially, or at least we've not given them higher doses of rituximab or even redosed them. Kidigo 2021, on another note, uh, recommend if platoir is still positive at six months, please redose with rituximab. And we need funding, funding, um, in all countries now for rituximab. Um, now, obviously our concerns is not like patients' concerns. Like when you see patients in clinic, they're not really thinking about the podocytes and the cytoskeleton and all that. We get lots of questions from patients uh, saying, well, because after this lecture, we, we, we could probably think, well, how do we respond to these questions? Um, I remember when, um, a few years ago when I did not really find any anti our antibodies, I could not really answer this question to the patient. Does that mean I do not have a primary membranous GN? Whilst now you could say, actually, you could still have a primary membranous GN. Um, how often do I need to check my anti our Now, actually we have an answer. Um, and then most patients are very tired. Um, they ask about new therapies. And they always worry about reaching renal replacement therapy. Now, there is no time to talk about the future with idiopathic membranous GN. Um, I hope I just managed to convince everyone to look to, to, to try and consider rituximab more often. But there are other B cell depleting agents because if we think of this disease, we either want to hammer the mother cells that are forming all the antibodies or you wanna to go to the kidneys and stop it from leaking protein. So there are other B cell depleting agents, the ofatuminumab and the obinutuzumab, very difficult to pronounce, uh, but they could be very effective in refractory um, cases who actually have not responded to rituximab. And there are a number of studies going on. And then there's the belumumab, the anti-bath therapy, anti-plasma cell therapy, and anti-complement therapy. Um, this is my email address for any questions. Thank you very much for listening and being such a fabulous audience. Some tables here, whoever wants to go in details. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sari, for this uh, illustrative, very nice lecture, especially you shared with us your experience. Um, we have a lot of questions here. Uh, I will uh, read them for you. 
Uh, start uh, from the by the first question in patients with membranous nephropathy on rituximab with frequent relapses. When to suspect rituximab antibodies, and what to do in such cases? Do you, do do you meet some cases that you suspect that the case has uh, that is resistant to rituximab that the patient developed rituximab antibodies, or do you measure the rituximab antibodies in the blood routinely? Do you have an experience uh, with that? Actually, this is a very good question, but I'm afraid we do not test for rituximab antibodies, um, at least uh, within my uh, career in UK. I have not heard of it done before, but uh, it would be nice to know if anyone on the call has tested for rituximab antibodies. I think it, it, it was tested or it is tested uh, in research only. Uh, what I know that uh, the development of uh, rituximab antibodies is very rare to be found in patients with lymphoma treated with rituximab, but in patients with autoimmune disorders may get or may have a high risk of uh, developing antibodies, but there is a conflict now if these antibodies uh, have a significant impact on the drug level or uh, efficacy or not, and to measure them or not. So I think that it's only a research, research question that we don't have a clinical application or clinical answer now, right? Amazing. That's very useful to know. Oh, uh, another question about the drug that you said, uh, its pronunciation is uh, very difficult, obtinonuzumab, membranous. Mm -hmm. I, I think that you mentioned it is uh, of the future therapies, right? Yes, so there are a couple of trials, but very small number. And I think they're trying to treat the patients who are resistant, or let's not say resistant, but have not responded to the rituximab itself. Uh, so that's why uh, they're trying to use other types of B-cell, uh, anti-B cell uh, therapies. Okay, so so it may have it may has a, a role in rituximab resistant cases later on in our guidelines. Yes. Yes. Okay. Another question is asking about the effect of air pollution on membranous nephropathy incidences and severity. Again, I do not. So we all talk about the pollution and the environmental factors. Um, yeah, there are a lot of studies looking into this. Um, I personally read them, uh, but it's kind of like in the air. You cannot really be sure. Um, but I, I would say that it's probably related uh, to many types of GN because if you think about what messes up our immune system, I would say lots of triggers from the environment, which lead to your own immune system formulating these nasty antibodies and starting to fight yourself. Um, and we see that in, in, in other types of GN, like, for example, in vasculitis. A patient can be very stable, but then you go into a relapse just as you picked an infection. So I think I, I don't see really uh, much difference between pollution and infection. Um, I, I would agree that there is probably a relationship. Uh, yes, as, as you mentioned, pollution in general is related to multiple glomerular fraps, especially those uh, which presents, those which present with uh, nephrotic syndrome more and as you said it may be a, a cofactor like infection for the precipitation of the glomerular nephritis okay we have another question in presence of new safe medications did you treat all patients with membranous nephropathy or according to proteinuria level and egfr the question is asking if we now uh, have a very good effective and safe drug to treat membranous you still wait and give time for membranous nephropathy for auto remission, or you will start the this new safe drug from the start? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So going back to the guidelines, um, I would say that if you have a normal renal function and you have a non-nephrotic range proteinuria, most nephrologists will be very comfortable to watch and see what the ACE, ARBs, and optimizing treatment with conservative therapy would do. In moderate risk, which means that you're getting more proteinuria 
but maybe a bit less, um, but, and you're still having a normal kidney function. I would say some nephrologists will wait and see, but no longer than six months maybe. But definitely you will not wait if it's a high risk or a very high risk, because that would not, you know, you, we will just be wasting time and losing um, kidney function. Great. Uh, another question is about uh, what is the rule of complement 3A inhibitors in the management of membrane nephropathy? I think that you mentioned in uh, the last line of your slide about the future therapy that may be uh, a rule, there may be a rule for uh, complement inhibitors in management of membrane nephropathy, right? That is true, but okay. this is very early days. Uh, there is no uh, solid data about this yet. So it's all just trials. And complement inhibitors are being used um, in, in most types of GN. I think it's kind of like a ladder, like we, we try with all the tricky types of glomerulonephritis to, to go through all you know, the weapons we have. And now as uh, new treatments are coming out, we are trying to group all the patients who are actually resistant to the standard therapy and trial and put them into trials. There are a few patients here that we send for trials, um, especially those that fail to respond to uh, most treatments. I have not mentioned uh, that cohort because in my audit, we were only looking into the people who were actually patients, you know, receiving rituximab in particular. Okay. Uh, another question about plasma exchange. Why plasma exchange failed in membranous nephropathy with high anti-PL editor? Do you have any experience in your, uh, regarding my knowledge that... Uh, there are case reports for the use of uh, plasma exchange in uh, patients with membranous nephropathy and crescent glomerular nephritis. Uh, but well, I have, yeah, right. What is your experience? I'm sorry I'm to interrupt, Dr. Abdelgawet. No, no, no. Have... I am waiting to say to, to hear to you. So we have never actually uh, provided plasma exchange for uh, idiopathic membranous GN cohort, but we have provided that in uh, our crescentic GN. Um, and obviously it rapidly progressive GN. So yeah, it could work, but not in idiopathic membranous GN. Um, and I think, it, you know, looking at, I mean, I, I think I, I am a believer that it will not work because if we think about it, it takes a very long time for these sub-epithelial deposits to actually, you know, hit the kidney and then lead to damage of the podocytes. Um, so I think a quick fix would not necessarily be like just removing the anti antibodies. I think a, quick, a quicker fix would actually be addressing like the factory itself, the B cells uh, themselves. Um, with the um, anti are antibodies, I mean, I know there are many patients who actually go into clinical remission and they still have anti or antibodies hanging around in very decent levels. So even if we remove these antibodies, I do not think uh, this could even be a study because you need to follow up people for quite a long time in order to prove that these people have entered a remission because we removed the uh, anti or antibodies if that makes sense. Yes. Okay, what about the use of uh, the new era in medicine and nephrology, the use of SCGLT2 inhibitors in membranous nephropathy by name? Do you oh, have- I was waiting for this question yeah. actually. So yeah, obviously we are throwing SGLT2 as we speak in almost all types of nephrotic syndrome. Uh, it is amazing that we are becoming very like much braver nowadays we we try and um we try and get funding because obviously um so far the sglt2 was coincidentally uh, proven to have an effect in the iga nephropathy uh, cohort uh, while they were doing the dapa ckd study 
But um, there are other types of GN where, where uh, actually this medicine will work beautifully because we all know that it does minimize proteinuria. So um, again, it will minimize your proteinuria, but I do not think it will treat the underlying cause. So it could be um, an extra treatment you give to achieve um, a clinical remission, but I do not think you are actually treating the main cause. So um, it could be used, but not as a definitive treatment. Okay. Okay. Regarding the use of rituximab, uh, how you follow up uh, rituximab effectiveness? Do you follow CD20, C, sorry, CD19 or IgG level, or you just give the doses according to affected regimen? So this has changed in practice. I remember I used to work in another hospital five years ago where we always checked for the CD cells. Um, and in, in nowadays, we don't actually. Uh, I think the only thing we do is we sometimes check for the level of immunoglobulins to, just to check that we are not hammering the patient too much and then they're not going to go into infections. Hmm. But you can clearly say whether the patient has gone into a clinical remission or not. Okay. We do recheck anti plateauar antibodies, and we do check, obviously, the level of proteinuria very regularly. Great. Is the rituximab covered by insurance in your uh, hospital? It is covered uh, by insurance. You mean private insurance? Uh, uh, the question is like that. I don't know what it means. Yes, uh, yeah. How uh, rituximab, uh, how do you supply patients with, with rituximab? Do you, do you pay money for it or just a free? No, it is for free. We The patients do not pay uh, money for rituximab at all. It is provided for free uh, through the NHS. And every time a guideline comes up, it mm. is updated on the, uh, you know, if, if it's a FDA approved treatment, then uh, obviously we can apply for funding. And as long as it is FDA approved, we've got supportive uh, guidelines and we follow the NICE or the Kidigo, then it means that uh, NHS should provide it. Okay. Um, so it's easier now. Okay. Regarding patients on rituximab with uh, and the patient uh, has a low IgG, uh, do you replace uh, this patient with immunoglobulin or just stop the rituximab dose? Uh, we more likely, we, we stop the rituximab. So we withhold the rituximab is the proper okay. word. Uh, I have seen one or two patients um, given immunoglobulins, but we're not believers of that. This is very like a gray area, but we more say, okay, we're not going to give you the infusion today because your immunoglobulins are actually too low. Okay. Uh, do you rec recommend uh, to repeat biopsy in patients with membranous ne nephropathy during uh, follow-up, just a protocol biopsy or not? Well, it depends why you want to repeat the biopsy. You might want to repeat a biopsy because you think that the patient has another pathology, um, like they just started to fall out of the normal sort of um, formats of idiopathic membranous GN, like as in how patients present. You might want to repeat a biopsy um, for any other reason, but I don't think we, we should be repeating biopsies to retreat patients. Uh, it also depends on the EGFR, but we don't generally repeat biopsies unless on a balance this is going to change the management. Uh, so if we are suspecting that the patient has a different type of super added GN, then we might do that, but not, not as a protocol at all. Okay, for how long? Uh... Rituximab can be used after using calcineurin inhibitors to inhibit the relapse after a tapering of uh, CNIs. Uh, so I have seen uh, patients being, uh, if you're going to induce the patients using rituximab and you're using CNIs, you're going to keep them on CNIs for a pretty long time. It's very, it's too brave to, you know, to, to stop the CNI inhibitors. And then if they go into a relapse, whatever the time, you can still give them uh, two more infusions, like another cycle of rituximab. I would say there is no limit. Uh, according to the audit I've done, I've only seen people who relapsed twice. 
and they do go into a very um, they enjoy a, a nice period of a remission. So I don't think there's a rule uh, as long as you're safe to do that. I don't really think there is a rule. And if you have any other experience, you can share it with us as well. No, no, I, I am totally uh, agreeing with your uh, opinion. Uh, you mentioned that rituximab can be lost in urine with, uh, with the proteins yes. and proteinuria. There's a question asking you about how much loss of rituximab in urine is. Uh, is there any suspected percentage uh, or classification according to level of proteinuria? Or just the main idea that it is lost in urine? No, I think it's just the idea. No one has tested for this, uh, you know, exact amount. I would always say just bear in mind if someone is very nephrotic, maybe get this nephrotic syndrome more under control, either by conservative therapy or whatever it is, you know, managing their blood pressure, etc. cetera. Um, because you, you will probably lose um, a lot of the rituximab in the urine or part of it. Uh, I don't, I, this is just like a, uh, a note rather than me saying 20% uh, is lost or 25% is lost. I think it would be a difficult one. Okay. Um, another question, can we depend on type of IgG subclass to define which case can be on uh, C3, uh, complement 3 inhibitors or not? Um, that is a very smart question, actually. Yes. I've not thought about it. Um, I'm not sure what the answer would be, but I do know that the type of immunoglobulin related to uh, idiopathic membrane as GN is the IgG4, yes. mostly. Uh, okay, another question I would like to ask if we, if we have a patient with primary antiphospholipid syndrome with a kidney biopsy showing a picture of secondary membrane nephropathy, is there a rule for rituximab in such case or not? Primary antiphospholipid no. syndrome with a biopsy of secondary membrane nephropathy. So is that not like, is that like an SLE patient? Or, so are we saying that this it is patient just, has... Just a primary antiphospholipid. I don't see a reason why you should not give rituximab. Yes, me too. Yes. I mean, rituximab even works for primary type. It's very good. I mean, yeah. Or if the secondary cause itself can be treated by rituximab. I don't think secondary. If you only have a purely secondary membrane as GN, you need to treat the cause. There's yes. no role for rituximab. No. Yes, I agree with you. Okay, that was <clears throat> our last question. Um, I. Uh, would like to thank you again, Dr. Sally, for this uh, nice lecture thank and the powerful discussion. Thank yes. you very much. Uh, mm. And uh, it was a pleasure to be with all of you. And I'm looking forward to more sessions in the future. Yes, sure. We'll have uh, multiple webinars with you later on, inshallah. 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 Okay. Have yes. a lovely evening, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.